So this is a book called The Raven of Zurich. Here he is. His name was Felix Zomari. And it says here, a preface by Otto von Habsburg, the high nobility. And here you see the raven with a full moon and a uh, skull of death and all these, um, all these magical books and uh, incantations, probably. And in this video, I would like to tell you about a very dangerous Swiss banker called the Raven of Zurich. And his name was Felix Zomari, which sort of phonetically associates with Sumeria. Zomari, Sumeria. So here you see his name, Felix Zomari, and here is Sumeria. So in Sumeria, the name is very pharaonic, because in the Demotic pharaonic language, me, it means pyramid, ri is the sun, and a, it means big or pregnant. So it means we might be, um, and so I, I could translate for you, but I don't have my books here. And here you got the same, me, ri. Zomari, Zumeria. And um, so here it says, born out of the sun, you know, using the pyramid. And here you see these guys with the wrist watch watches here as well, which is very old. And he is having this little handbag. And uh, remember the video I made in Strasbourg, um, you know, the spy of Napoleon, um, also with the little handbag, and that's only like 200 years ago, and there's still people who know about this and what it means, you know. And uh, the video, you can find it in this same uh, channel here. So just look at the, uh, the thumbnails of the, uh, in all the videos, just scroll down. So there's definitely a phonetic um, association in the name with Sumeria. Now, why was he nicknamed the Raven of Zurich? And who called him that? Well, the people had no idea who he was and still don't know. So it must be his own community. And he must have been proud of the nickname for using it as the title of his book. Now, what is a raven in the mythical and metaphysical sense of the word? In most ancient cultures, the raven is related to death, a bringer of ill omen and a trickster, which seems to fit exactly with what the Raven of Zurich was doing in two world wars of death, destruction, and shady money transactions of Pharaoh's elite in Zurich, the financial capital of Europe, and probably even of the entire world. The Raven of Zurich, the bringer of death, of which I will tell you more in this video. The Swiss raven was married with the Countess May Domblin de Ville, which you can read here. So here it says, uh, uh, May Zomari, verheiratet, it means married. So she was married to uh, Felix Zomari. Her name was also sometimes Maria Zomari. Domblin de Ville, Maria Gräfin, it means a countess. Now here's some more. And here it says, uh, weibliche Bankangestellte, I mean working at a bank. Yeah, Domblin de Ville, Maria Gräfin von. And I don't know what it says more. Mm. Yeah. Okay, 
So this is um, Mrs. Raven, if you like. Eh? And of course, as always, the nobility. The Countess married the Raven on April the 2nd, 1930. What you can read here in the book. Now, why is the date of his marriage of this Swiss bankster so important? Because one and a half months later, the BIS and Bank of International Settlements was founded on May 17th of the same year of 1930, about which I'll tell you more a bit later on here in the video. So here you see on page 160 about the Raven of Zurich, we were married on April the 2nd, 1930 in Salzburg. And I'll tell you some more about it. So here he talks a little bit more about his future wife on chapter 35, uh, marriage. In the spring of 1929, Countess May, May, Damblin de Ville joined our bank as an executive assistant. The position had been advertised internationally. Hers was an old noble family from Lorraine in France, northern France, tracing its origins back to 1370. That's very old, you know. And remember that the Knights Templars, they were burned in 1314, just before. So the origins go back to 1370, uh, which had emigrated in 1791, first to Russia and then to Austria. So this is a very old um, aristocratic, pharaonic family. And you have to know the nobility does not marry outside of the nobility. So Mr. Sumeria, he was also part of Pharaoh's nobility, which is already in his name, you know, with all the demotic uh, words in his name. So here you can see these poor people, and it says the whole catch. It's the censorship vocabulary. Because if I use the other name, my video gets censored. You see here this entrance and the, uh, the garments. So it's probably the descendants of the Raven family of the aristocratic Domblin de Ville bloodline of the Countess, who made some real nasty jokes a couple of years back, couple of years back, about the whole catch on Swiss national TV, which you can see for yourself in this YouTube video by De Ville on their Swiss State TV YouTube channel. Well, De Ville, if you shove the intonation more up front, you get the word devil, right? How appropriate for the Swiss beast in the Alps, the raven of Zurich, and the Swiss nobility, De Ville, or devil, with their anti jaywalker shows on Swiss state television, SRF, well, it should be clear by now that Pharaoh's nobility are not very fond of the jaywalkers. So here you can see it. They never... So here's that building again. Uh, from the whole catch, which I just showed you before. And here you can see they never returned the, the gold, you know. So strange, so we melted it. Well, it's funny, isn't it? And here it says, Os SRF Comedy. It means Schweizer Radio Fernsehen. Swiss radio and TV comedy. This is the official Swiss uh, state TV. And they have this program about De Ville, just like the aristocratic family who married uh, into the uh, Felix uh, Zomari 
uh, dynasty, a very important bankster. So here's the title and here's the channel name. So you can look it up yourself. And it is, it was six years ago. Uh, really disgusting the the type of jokes the Swissies make about this terrible event in history. I really don't appreciate the jokes the Swissies are making. The Swissies are making about this. The Raven family lived in the Sonnenbergstraße in Zurich, Switzerland, in an area for the elite called Sonnenberg, meaning Mountain of the Sun, which undoubtedly full of pharaonic descendants in Pharaoh's main base in the Alps, who finally called it Mountain of the Sun as a direct reference to the sun god Amun-Ra of the great Ennead of Egypt. The Sun Mountain in Zurich is part of the bigger area called Zurich Mountain or Zurich Berg in German with a lot of forest. So here together with the Swiss flag you see Amun Ra and there's a lot of sun in the Alps. Here it says on page 143 that in 1922 the Raven of Zurich he bought a small house on the Zurich back, Zurich back, on the Zurich mountain. And here it says, after, on page 160, after the wedding, or to the countess, we traveled to Sorrento and spent a long time in Italy to the astonishment and occasional indignation of the banking community who felt this prolonged, prolonged wedding trip of a colleague at such a time almost as a provocation. Back in Zurich, I divided my time between the bank and my house, where many interesting people came to visit us. There, on the Sonnenberg, that means the Sun Mountain, one could express opinions openly that were considered taboo elsewhere. People of the most, you know, etc. So, the Sonnenberg, yeah. That's why he was living, which is a part of the Zurich back, the Sun Mountain and the Zurich Mountain, the elite part. I'm still at page 160. The Raven says, back in Zurich, I divided my time between the bank and my house, where many interesting people came to visit us. And there on the Sonnenberg, the uh, the Sun Mountain, one could express opinions openly that were considered taboo elsewhere. Now, why did he say that? He apparently he felt entirely safe in Switzerland. You know, it's the base, it's their base, you know. He was amongst the other conspirators, you know, uh, because they're the laws of silence in the base of the Knights Templars, you know. So that's why he could say this, you know. There on the Sun Mountain, one could express opinions openly that were considered taboo elsewhere. I mean, Switzerland is completely tight. It's airtight. You know, it's the total omerta, which comes out of the Knights Templars anyway, and nothing will ever spill out until Homie Ross came around, uh, around the corner. Until Homie Ross came along, eh? And that's why they destroyed Homie Ross and his family. So here you can see, here it says Zurich back. This is the Zurich mountain. And the Sonnenbergstraße is a bit down. The, um, the Sun Mountain Street where he was living. So this is Zurich. Here's the lake. Probably the Zurich lake. I don't know. And uh, so later on in this, uh, what I'm explaining, this becomes very important. And so you remember this, and I'll I'll show I show it to you like uh, later on. So here's the Zurich Berg, the Zurich Mountain, and here the 
the Son Mountain is like here. So here he was living, Sonnenbergstrasse, the Sun Mountain Street, and the Zurich Berg was here. And later on, I'll show you some more. Oh yeah, here it says Zurich Berg, the Zurich Mountain. And go back to the other here, Sonnenbergstrasse. And it becomes very important in this um, explanation. The Raven of Zurich was a highly influential Swiss banker during the two world wars. It is therefore no coincidence that the Raven of Zurich lived practically down the road of Villa Schönberg, where Hitler got invited on August the 3rd 1923 in Zurich, Switzerland, which 100 year Jubilee Centennial got celebrated by the Swiss media a couple of months back on August the 3rd, 2023, when it was exactly 100 years ago that Hitler got invited to Switzerland and financed by the Swiss nobility of the Swiss general Ulrich Wille Jr., whose mother, Clara, Countess of Bismarck, was of the house of von Bismarck. So here is the Villa Schönberg. Berg means mountain and Schön means beautiful. It means the beautiful mountain. Well, this is supposed to be the beautiful mountain. And it was on August 30th to 1923 when Adolf Hitler, he was here and he held a speech. And I have no doubt as the Raven of Z Zurich, the big financer, he was just living down the road that he was here as well. And also Richard Wagner, a big anti jaywalker he also lived here in the 19th century. And Rudolf Hess, he was here at the same time, at uh, August 30th, 1923. And Countess Clara von Bismarck was the mother of Swiss General Ulrich Wille, Jr., in fact. And she was married to also called Swiss General Ulrich Wille, Sr., that was the father. And again, I'll show it to you on the map, the Raven of Zurich. At the same time, he was living right around the corner. And I know that he was definitely here, together with many, many others. This is where it happened. The beginning of World War II and all the ugly things happening. So here it says, Villa Schönberg, where they were all at, at uh, August 30th, uh, 1923. And here once more, Villa Schönberg. The raven, he was living here. Well, I show it to you now. Here, Zurichberg, the Zurich mountain. And he was actually living here in the Sonnenbergstraße. And Hitler, he came here, and uh, Richard Wagner, Rudolf Hess, they were all here. It's just down the road, you know. And now, the Swiss general and his mother, the um, Clara Countess von Bismarck, they were living here which is just a couple of kilometers here. And here's a, a big Swiss um, uh, neo-Nazi living here. Uh, he's also in parliament. He was the head of the Swiss SVP party, uh, Christoph Blocher. You know, they're all here. You know, they're all together here. So again, here was the Hitler house, the Raven here. And this is just a couple of kilometers down the road. So this was the guy, the general Uli, Ulrich Wille and his mother von Bismarck who invited Hitler 
here. And with the raven just living down the court, down the road here. And this is the, it says here in French, Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Zurich. That's the ETH, the technical school where Rudolf Hess, he was uh, attending which is just right to next to where the raven was living, like here, somewhere. And here was the Hitler House Villa Schoenberg. So they all knew each other, and they were all in the, the Villa Schoenberg, here, Villa Schoenberg, like a little castle here in Zurich, where they all met up. Here you can see how the Swiss media, they were, they were practically celebrating the uh, centennial. Here it says, heute vor 100 Jahren, 100 years ago, on August 30th, 1923, Adolf Hitler in the Villa Schoenberg. And that was August the 30th, 2023. That's here, SRF. They, they are the same ones who made the, uh, the joke about the, um, about the whole catch. You know, really disgusting jokes, you know, about something you shouldn't joke about, to my opinion. And here as well, on, on TV, it was everywhere. And people were celebrating it in Switzerland. You know, here in the, in the newspaper, this one, and uh, here, fundraising tour for the dictator Adolf Hitler in Switzerland, you know. And this article here, very interesting, with the picture of Adolf Hitler in Zurich. And here it also says here, and it was all over the media, with lots of Swissies celebrating the uh, the hundred year centennial, the jubilee of Adolf Hitler being financed in Zurich in Switzerland by the uh, by the Swiss elite and this. And the Swiss nobility, they're all behind it. So here you can see about the Villa Schoenberg in Zurich, in Zurich. Here you can see it from the other side. The picture before was from this side, where it's going down. You know, it's like on the mountain. Here you see the Swiss cross, of course, with a square in it, you know, for the concept, double the concept of four. There's probably much, much more to see even. So it is a white cross on a red underground, you know. They, they, they put it practically everywhere, you know. And here it says, the officer Ulrich Wille Jr. In 1923, he invited Adolf Hitler in the Villa Schoenberg. You know, I, of course, I can only find it in German. So you're lucky that... Um, I speak German for you. And here, also uh, Richard Wagner. And here it says, Wagner, he lived from 1857 until 1858, uh, like uh, a little bit more than one year, where he made Tristan and Isolde. Uh, he also lived in this thing. And he was also a, a very big anti-Jaywalker. And of course, there were many, many, many others uh, living in this place. Yeah, they, all, they all came together, there, you know. So this is about Ulrich Wille Jr. That was the general who invited uh, Adolf Hitler to this house here. It says he uh, invited Adolf Hitler and also Rudolf Hess in August 1923 here in the Villa Schoenberg in Zurich. And also, and they were actually living there. The, here it says, the, um, um, the, the man and wife villa, they were living in the Villa Schoenberg. But they had many houses, also in Meilen, which I'll show you now. And here it says, in, also, they also had the, the Villa Wesendonk. Oh, look, another castle. Also in, also in Zurich. In 1912, the German Emperor William II, Wilhelm II, he was even there. All these war makers, you know, they all came there in Switzerland, okay? 
and the raven of Zurich, the guy, the, 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 the huge financer of it all, he was just living down the corner. And you're not going to tell me that he wasn't there. And nobody talks about it. So this is the father, Ulrich Wille, of the Swiss general Ulrich Wille Jr., who invited uh, Adolf Hitler in that house where they all, um, Villa Schönberg, where they all came. And here, you know, it's all nobility, von Berneck. Uh, all, the old friends, well, I'll let you read it yourself. And um, yeah, the personal life. Um, they settled in Meilen, which I just shown to you. It's also in Zurich here, in the canton of Zurich, which is also just down the road from the rest here. And he married, uh, Villa was married to Countess Constanza Maria Amalia Clara von Bismarck, the daughter of Count Friedrich Wilhelm von Bismarck. Yeah, there you go. And here, Otto von Bismarck. Well, they're all there. Yeah. And um, it's all the same clan. And this, this is, you know, this is where they organized and financed uh, World War II, you know. And it says also somewhere he was a um, he was a friend of the German emperor. I don't know where it said. So um, um, the emperor Wilhelm the second. So you know, it was all about getting him back. You know, the Second World War, getting the emperor back on the throne. You know, I hear as a German of Germanophile. And a Teutonophil, have you ever, you ever heard that word? Close to Kaiser Wilhelm II. There you go. You know, he was a very close friend. And, um, well, he needed to get back on the throne. So that's why they financed him in Zurich, Switzerland, in the. So you must always look at the map, you know, if you. And see where they live, you know, just as I did. Um, um, yeah, I always do this, you know, always look at the map where they're situated, you know, uh, just like the uh, the British um, cyber squadron, who are, who are, you know, just five clicks down the road from Bitchud, you know, very important. Look at the map. They were all living together. Rudolf Hess, Ulrich Wille, and inviting Adolf Hitler, the Raven was there, Richard Wagner, the German Emperor Wilhelm II, the uh, von Bismarck, they all concentrated in Zurich in the same, even in the same area in Zurich. So, so the mother of the Swiss general Ulrich Wille was Clara von Bismarck, and the house of Bismarck is a very powerful German aristocratic family with the Isis horns in their coat of arms and the concept of three. So here you can see that the Isis horns, there one crown, another crown. Here's a knight. Here's the concept of three. And here as well, which I told you is them. A lot of blue for the war crown. There you can see it. The Isis horns, very important. Uh, normally the Isis horns, you know, she's got the sun in the middle. Well, these ones, they got a, a crown, a double crown. And, um, and Germany's first chancellor was Otto von Bismarck. There was Georg von Bismarck, a German general under Hitler. And they're still in German politics, like the Prince of Bismarck after the war. Also, the Bismarck descendant, the Swiss general Ulrich Wille Jr., lived in Meilen and in the Villa Schönberg, practically down the road from the Raven banker, who himself, of course, he was married with the Countess. The Countess uh, Deville or Devil. Uh, you can read it yourself. 
It's an extremely powerful family. And they're very much in Switzerland and financing the, you know, fi financing the, the Nazis and the Hamas and, you know. So, as I just told you, also the top Nazi, Rudolf Hess, was living in Zurich where he was studying at the ETH Federal Institute of Technology, also down the road from the Raven, Felix Summary, the most powerful banker in the world of its time. Rudolf Hess was a friend of Swiss General Ulrich Welle Jr. Therefore, Hess invited Hitler to come to Switzerland, where he got financed by the Swiss General and by the wealthy Swiss behind the screens, just as Swissy financed Hamas, they always do this. Now, my assumption is that Hitler also met the Raven, which can't be otherwise, as they were all of Pharaoh's nobility, they all lived in Zurich, practically next door from each other, it was about substantial financing and politics, and the Raven knew the German Emperor Wilhelm II, who wanted to get back on the throne. I'm 100% sure that the Raven was the keystone figure in financing of Adolf Hitler and organizing World War II. And guess who was also at the Federal Institute of Technology of Switzerland, together with Rudolf Hess in Zurich. Well, the Nazi war criminal Werner von Braun, also of the German nobility. So here's his V2 rocket. Here it says his nobility title, Freiherr von Braun. It means the free, the free gentleman. Like the Herrenrasse, you know, the master race, as the Nazi said. They said the Herrenrasse, the, which is the master race. Well, he got one of the Herrenrasse, Frei Herrenrasse, you know. And uh, here's his signature. Here he is in his Nazi uniform. This is the SS, the uh, um, Totenkopfverbände here. And here is his signature Werner von Braun. And it's him. You can see that, you know. And here it says the ETH Zurich, Switzerland, the Federal High, um, Institute of uh, Technology. So he learned all about rockets. He learned it in Switzerland. He learned the things he did later on in his life. He learned it in Switzerland. And Freiherr von Braun bombed England with his V2 rockets and used many Auschwitz concentration camp inmates at Auschwitz III, Buna Monowitz, of whom many died of exhaustion. For this killer, Freiherr Werner von Braun of Pharaoh's nobility. So, here again, his uh, signature, Werner von Braun. Here the swastika, here the Templar cross, here the eagle, or probably a falcon. Here it says ETH, the uh, Federal Technical School of Zurich. And here it says Zurich, Arbeit macht frei. And uh, here it says the Swiss connection. The Swiss connection is all over. They finance Hitler. Here's another Swiss connection of the um, rocket construction of Buno, uh, Buna uh, Monowitz in Auschwitz III. So, I mean, these people getting murdered here and the Arbeit macht frei, it's all connected to the ETH of Zurich and the entire Swiss connection. They were all together in Zurich and they all knew each other as they were all of the aristocracy and attending nobility's circles only. 
They were all in the Villa Schoenberg. Well, of course, not this one, but there's another Swiss connection. And uh, we all know this guy, Elon Musk, of the, um, the Swiss Holderman dynasty, as you can see here. His mother was a Holderman, and he was in the ETHs in Zurich. Werner, Freiherr Werner von Braun. So I wrote down here, Switzerland's rocket boys of Pharaoh's nobility. And again, there's a connection between the rocket boys, uh, crimes, uh, terrible crimes against humanity, like he wants to connect a human brain to a computer, to the internet. All right, what about that, eh? Uh, he was using up, not just using, he was using them up, concentration camp inmates. I mean, it's all the nobility. He got the Holderman the nobility, he got the Freiherr von Braun nobility. And it's all through Switzerland. Always, always, always. It's always Switzerland because it's, it's their base. So here is the ETH in Zurich where Rudolf Hess, he was, and Freiherr Werner von Braun. It says it's the Federal Institute of Technology of Zurich. I'll let you read it yourself. It's, it's really, it's huge. And remember, the biggest banks are in Switzerland, the UBS. The biggest pharmaceutical company, Roche and Novartis, they're also in Switzerland. So I guess maybe this is also the biggest in the world. Uh, so I'll let you read it yourself. I haven't read it all, you know. It's uh... So here you can see, it's, it's huge. Look at it, so many buildings. And, and there are more buildings. It's absolutely huge, you know. In Hunger Bag, another bag, another mountain, right? It's absolutely huge, you know, it's like, so again, there's much more to find, but I'm not going to read it everything, you know, so you do that for me. Okay. Now here, this is interesting, there's this thing called Eris, it rings a bell, eh? Well, phonetically, it sounds the same as the Greek god of war and destruction, or the war and courage and destruction called Eris, with an E here, but it sounds exactly the same, and they know it. It's the Swiss Academic Space Flight Initiative. And of course, all the, um, all the technology, you know, they're going to use it against mankind. You know, like Werner von Braun. I always use it against mankind. So, yeah. N notable alumni and faculty. So there is Albert Einstein. He lived in Switzerland, you know, he helped making the atomic bomb and all that. And here we got, um, we got uh, Werner von Braun here. Yeah. Big criminals. I don't know what's happening here with the... Okay. And here, there's, uh, here, it's about the military academy. The Swiss military academy uh, they're training there you know like the ss werner von braun they all go there you know, all the big nazi criminals you know uh, the, instead of writing down the ss they write down the military just military academy it sounds good i eh? neutral switzerland eh? so uh, you read it yourself so freiherr werner von braun and probably a lot of more Nazi war criminals going there. Eh? So here is about Werner von Braun. I'm not going to go very long into it because this movie is, uh, this documentary is actually about the Raven of Zurich. But as he was also in Zurich, it is very important to understand it. So it says here Werner Magnus Maximilian Freiherr von Braun. And um, so um, it's the um, it's the nobility. It, it said here somewhere. Anyway, Freiherr it means uh, uh, nobility. And um, so here it says here yeah, early life. His um, about his uh, 
So his father, Magnus Freiherr von Braun, and um, is a descendant. Oh, also his mother, his mother, Emmy von Quistorf, you know, with the von, it's all nobility. And her ancestry goes all the way back to a uh, descendant of Philip III of France, of Valdemar I of Denmark, of Robert III of Scotland, Edward III of England. Now you got the order of the garter again. And Sigmund von Braun here. After the war, he, uh, he, he was also a rocket scientist. Well, look at that, you know. So from his mother's side and father's side, it's uh, it's all high nobility. And uh, yeah, again, pharaohs. Eh? So um, I'll let you read it here yourself. So Nazi membership, he was in the SS. I uh, just showed you in a SS uniform. And um, uh, here, oh, here it says membership in the Allgemeine SS. Well, not so much Allgemein. Allgemein, it means the general SS. Oh, you know, work on the Nazi regime. I'll let you read it yourself. I didn't read it all, eh? or actually nothing. And here it says about the slave labor, how we used up, you know, concentration camp inmates who, who died, you know. So here you got arrested, but he never did, uh, he never went to prison. The, the Yanks, they pulled him out. The U.S. Army career, I oh, even was in the U.S. Army. Oh, what about that? Eh? Look, there's his, his ID of the, U, the, the U.S. Army. Well, we all know about the paperclip thing, you know. Religious conversion, of course, yeah. Yeah, 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 of course. What is that? Frederick the First, Odvai the the Third, hmm. and a Nazi, a Nazi career, yeah. A career at the Nazi. Oh, engineering philosophy. Oh, he was really a philosopher. Eh? Now, whom did he marry? Maria von Braun. That's probably also of the... Um, ah, he married um, his first cousin, von Quistop, of course. As I told you, nobility only marries nobility. Well, it goes a lot longer, the website here, but you look it up yourself. The um, I'm showing it because he was in Zurich together with the Raven of Zurich. And they knew each other, absolutely. And guess who had lived in the Villa Schönberg in Zurich, where Hitler held a speech on August the 3rd, 1923. Well, Hitler's favorite composer, Richard Wagner, also used to live there. Another one of the gang, and all converging into Switzerland. Richard Wagner was a fanatic MCJ walker, just as Mr. Hitler himself and the rest of the gang. So here you see Richard Wagner, and here Mr. Hitler. And here it says Villa Schönberg in Zurich, Switzerland. So it's always Switzerland, and they were both very great anti-jaywalkers. I mean, would it be too hard to ask, you know, or to, to ask you to understand that this anti-jaywalker stuff, that it comes out of Switzerland and the Knights Templars, if all these guys, they all con connected to Switzerland, and they all have the same sort of ideas. So Richard Wagner, he was the, um, the favorite composer of uh, Mr. Hitler. And the whole thing, I tell you, it had nothing to do with German nationalism or... This is just a thing, you know, to um, to unite the German people, to make them uh, go to war for the for them, you know, for the... Uh, for the... Uh, for the whole nobility, yeah. 
And it's always Switzerland. It's all getting together in Switzerland. And the whole idea uh, comes out of Switzerland. Richard Wagner was a personal friend of the Swiss Johanna Spiri, who wrote the Swiss Heidi books, which I explain in this video here, that were abundantly used in the Swiss propaganda to fool us all about a so-called clean, neutral and innocent Switzerland. Whereas, in fact, they all were and still are a bunch of racists, Nazis and war financers. So this video about Heidi and also uh, Richard Wagner, I already told you all about it, so I don't have to do that again. And here's the title, Helvetic Horror Heidi, on my other channel, Homeland Security. It will never pop out because uh, I'm completely shadow banned and censored. So the best thing is go into the channel, go into the video section and uh, scroll it on. Uh, and here I explain about how the uh, the author about of the Heidi books, Johanna Spiri, she was a personal friend of uh, uh, Richard Wagner. And now we have the Wagner Group, you know, in Russia. And I have no doubt that she also went to the uh, Villa Schoenberg, the uh, Johanna Spiri. So... Richard Wagner, he lived in many places, but finally he settled down in this place here, Bayreuth. So here is the uh, raven of Zurich. He's going there. During, it's, it can be seen on page 171. During our stay, we were sought out by the well-known operatic bass, Emmanuel Liszt, who asked us to take him to Bayreuth in our car. He was to sing there, but despite the short distance from Marienbad, in the, so this is in Germany, eh? there was no easy train connections and no international taxi service yet existed. We ordered tickets for Die Meister Singer and Parzival, dropped list off in Bayreuth and took rooms in Nuremberg. When we wanted to visit Dürer's house the next morning, we found the streets blocked. The Führer was expected in town. An officer saw the Swiss license plates and let our car through. I said to my wife, it's exactly like the East here. The natives have no rights and distinguished foreigners are allowed everything. That afternoon, we arrived at the Feschpiel House in Bayreuth and were kept, etc. So the Feschpiel House in Bayreuth, that's where Hitler went and also on this occasion. So Hitler met the Raven, of course. I mean, and uh, who already they knew each other from the uh, the Villa Schönberg in um, in Zurich, and they were there again at the same time, and of course they met. And this is where Hitler always went. So this one here, the Festspielhaus in Bayreuth, which are the um, they also call it the um, well the Festspielhaus. That's where Hitler always went to uh, to listen to the uh, Wagner music and where all the Nazis went to. And, and it's still all the neo-Nazis of the whole world, they still come there. Every year, there still are the Festspiele of Bayreuth. You can look it up in the internet. You know. And the Raven, he went there. The Swiss Raven was born in Austria like Adolf Hitler, and therefore we find a preface of the last crown prince of the huge Austro-Hungarian Empire, Otto von Habsburg, in the Memoirs of the Raven. Of course, the crown prince of Habsburg also wanted to get back on the throne of Austria just like the German Emperor Wilhelm II, although he pretended to be against the Nazis. But I have no doubt that in reality 
Otto von Habsburg made that alliance with the Nazis in order to get back on the throne of Austria and therefore needed the biggest financial grey eminence of his time, the Swiss Raven. So here it says the preface of Otto von Habsburg on the book of Felix Zomari, the Raven of Zurich. So here is a website about Otto von Habsburg and the Habsburg dynasty. They ruled over a, a huge empire, the Austro uh, Hungarian uh, Empire. And he said, he says he was the last crown prince of Austria Hungary. A huge empire. You know, you see, you see that there are two empires here. There's the uh, Croatian red and white checkerboard, which is the official pharaonic, the red house and the white house checkerboard. And he was a member of the Order of the Golden Fleece. I mean, about this guy, you know, I. I I could do three videos, but okay, the video is not about this, it's about the Raven, so I'll, you have to excuse me, I'll keep it short, you know. He was the uh, eldest son of Charles I and, uh, and the fourth Emperor of Austria. His wife, Zita of Bourbon Parma, it's all the European high nobility. He was born as uh, Otto was born as Franz Josef Otto Robert Maria Anton Karl Max not Marx Heinrich Sixtus Save Felix Renatus Ludwig uh, uh, von Habsburg uh, as the Archduke Otto of Austria and um, it says he was against Nazism but don't believe that you know. Um, no, he also possessed passports of the Order of Malta. Uh, yeah, the Order of Malta, the Hospitallers, you know, officially the Sovereign Military Hospitaller Order of Saint John of Jerusalem. That's where they come from. They, the Swiss Cross, the White Cross on a red underground. So his children here, or von Habsburg, von Habsburg, and um, yeah, that uh, he was a a huge friend, a, a big friend of the Raven. All the friends of the Raven, they're all high nobility, and and after the, yeah, it says after World War Two, he he knew Charles de Gaulle, also nobility de Gaulle. Sovereign Order of Malta again, diplomatic passport, he even had a Spanish diplomatic passport, etc. For for these people there are no borders, you know, there never were any borders, you know, they just do as they please. Well, I'll let you read it yourself. So the um he did the uh the preface to the Raven book. And um, only the elite of the world, he knew the entire elite of the world. The Raven of Zurich knew everyone and all the world leaders. The Raven of Zurich was close friends with Baron Jalma von Schacht, Hitler's banker and director of the BIS Bank of International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland where the theft of the Wall Street crash of 1929 went to in order to finance the German war industry of the Krupp von Bohlen und Halbach dynasty. And you all remember the Halbach girl from the documentary Making a Murderer, right? So here you see Hitler with the Baron Jalma von Schacht here it says, Baron Jalma von Schacht, Hitler's banker, director of the BIS, Bank of International Settlements, taking orders from 
the Raven of Zurich, which I'm going to explain you now. I have no doubt whatsoever that the Baron Jalmar von Schacht was also in the Villa Schoenberg in Zurich on August the 3rd, 1923, when they financed Adolf Hitler in Zurich. He was there, he knew them all, and he knew, most of all, the Raven of Zurich. So here we can see the Baron Jalmar von Schacht. Of course, they don't write it here. No, that's all being hidden. And here it says he was a, first, a fierce critic of his country's post-World War I reparations obligations, of course, through the, uh, the Bank of International Settlements, which finally the, uh, the American people paid with the, um, the Wall Street crash. He was also central in helping create the group of German industrialists and landowners that pushed Hindenburg to appoint the first NSDAP-led government. So here it reads landowners, so that's who were the landowners, nobility, and they still are, you know, everything belongs to them. They had a castle, they still have, and all the land around it belonged to them. So this is, again, the internal wall between the horizontal and the vertical rule. The landowners are the vertical rule, and the other ones who want to, you know, a horizontal rule, they, they are the other ones, you know, the, the New World's order. And um, yeah, I'll show you some more. Uh, I hear it says, Schacht was tried at Nuremberg but was fully acquitted despite Soviet objections. He never had any problems. You know. He was born in Prussia um, to William Leonard Ludwig Maximilian Schacht. Well, that's a, that's a very aristocratic name. And his father was married with the Baroness Constance Justine Sophie von Eggers, a native of Denmark. Well, the nobility doesn't marry with non-nobility and a lot of them they don't have the the von anymore in their names so he's um, his mother a baroness uh, his father with this incredible long name a maximilian they always have maximilian sort of in their names it's um it's all nobility you know of course it is you know uh, by behind the entire world war and all the wars. Schacht was a Freemason, having joined the large Urania zur Unsterblichkeit in 1908. Unsterblichkeit, that means um, you're never going to die. Urania, um, eternal. You know. During the First World War, Schacht was assigned to the staff of General von Lum, the banking commissioner for German occupied Belgium to organize the financing of Germany's purchase purchases in Belgium. Well, we remember who was the um, uh, the um, the director or the leader of the um, German mission over Belgium over the entire First War. Well, that was the Raven of Zurich. There was Felix. Summary. So that means Schacht, he was taking orders of the Raven of Zurich. And he stayed completely behind the screens for his whole life because he was the most important man behind it all, more important than Schacht. I mean, they could sacrifice Schacht in case, you know, but never Felix Summary. Never the Raven of Zurich. So here, you know, if he was a Freemason, as it says here, Schacht was a Freemason. Well, I mean, it's a bit hard to believe that the Nazis that persecuted the Freemasons, isn't it? Actually, it was 33rd degree. And he was so-called in the resistance after the war. Well, he's in an internment camp. Before it says he was acquitted, he was acquitted at Nuremberg. Okay, never had any real problems, though he was really one of the men behind the um, 
behind Hitler and the, and the entire Second World War. You know. He just died in Munich in 1970, you know, a free man. and The Baron, yeah. Well, here is the base, the Bank for International Settlements. The logo here has four parts for the concept of four, uh, which is stands for the square, and the square can also be seen here. And this is a circle, like a bit in the um, in a, th a third dimension, like a bit uh, like um, moved a bit, like an, um, under another angle. But it's so it's supposed to be a circle. So in a circle, the compass you can make a circle with it. So it says square and compass in the colors of the Knights Templars, red and white. And the squares here definitely says square and compass. And this is like the um, of the focus, you know, the uh, the crosshairs. You know, and the square is us, so they're, they're focusing on us, you know. The square, that's the base of the pyramid, that's us, you know, the uh, the slaves, yeah. Of course, we can say a lot about this, but I'll keep it short, try it. It's very difficult for me. So they talk about Schacht here. And I thought he was the first director. Uh, I think they changed it here in the Wikipedia. And the central bankers, Montague Norman, well, the Raven also knew Montague Morgan, uh, the central banker of uh, for the um, for England. There was no UK at the moment. It was England. And Jalmer Schacht for Germany. There's Jalmer Schacht. Here's Montague Norman. They all knew each other. And they both knew the Raven of Zurich even being good friends. And uh, uh, that's the number two building of the uh, the base. It's also in Basel. It's just a couple of hundred meters down the road. Uh, I went filming there once. And um, you shouldn't stand there too long because you get arrested by the police immediately. Well, what, what happened to people, you know. So, and this here is uh, the website on Felix Sommery, the Raven of Zurich. So, he was born 1881 in Vienna, where Hitler also was, you know, at the same time. And um, he died, of course, in Zurich in 1956. And he was an Austrian-Swiss banker. And here it says, uh, during World War I, he recognized the, um, the National Bank of Occupied Belgium, and he worked together with Jalma Schacht, of whom he speaks favorably in his memoirs. So here you can read some more about him. I'm not going too uh, deep into it here. Uh, so I'll let, you, I'll let you read it yourself. So here are the, um, probably the memoirs here, the Raven of Zurich. No, I don't see it, never mind. So this is the Raven of Zurich and he knew them all. And born in Austria, just like Adolf Hitler and he became Swiss. So for the Swiss, you know, it was no problem. You know, these people, they just make, give him a Swiss passport. Okay, no problem. For Sean Ross, you know, never. He's been terrorized for 26 years and it goes on. You know, this is the difference, you know. So in the book, The Raven of Zurich, his memoirs on page 157 here, the, it's the chapter, The World Depression, from 1929, yeah, the Wall Street crash, in 1932, and the biz got founded in 1930. So, and he's talking about it, during the time they stole the American savings of um, normal American citizens, the Wall Street crash. Um, he was meeting Schacht all the time. So now I'm going down page, and I'll show it to you how he was meeting with uh, the Baron Schacht, Jalma Schacht. So here it is. I stopped between trains at Baden-Baden at Schacht's invitation. He was engaged with the rep representative of the First National Bank of New York 
and First National Bank of Chicago in drafting the bylaws of the Bank of International Settlements in Basel. Here they stealing the uh, the Wall Street crash, yeah, which was to try to balance international payments in connection with the reparations agreements. When I was asked what I thought about all that, I answered with the uh, pun Ave Caesar Moratoria to Salutant. Yeah, yeah. At dinner with Reynolds and Taylor, I said that I would witness in the course of my forthcoming New York visit the beginning of the greatest crisis of our generation. Schacht hoped that the coming chaos would bring an end to the reparation pay payments. Well, who was paying the reparation payments was Germany. And he would hope that would end. Yeah, it ended because the Americans paid it with the, uh, the money of the Wall Street crash. They stole it. And uh, the, the Raven of Zurich is all behind it, you know, going to America, talking with the Federal Reserve and uh, transferring the money. I always sh already showed you this in the um, in my film, The Swiss Beast, Home of the Devil, part one. So here, right after the Wall Street crash heist, robbing the Americans of their money. Uh, right after it, so here it says in 1929, um, the Raven of Zurich is uh, talking about the um, about the Federal Reserve. So here, on my arrival, so that's the Raven talking here in New York, I called on, in 1929, eh? I called on a private banking firm friendly to Blanc Art and Company, and they are one of the senior partners who had been attorney, attorney to old John D. Rockefeller, was just about to go on a, on a meeting at the House of Morgan to discuss market support operations. When I asked what had been discussed with the Treasury and the Federal Reserve Bank officials, he answered with contempt, uh, with contempt about his own. He said, who bothers with that crowd in Washington? And when he came, I mean, a banker is saying, you know, like, who bothers about the politics or the government? We stand above it. That was mean. And when he came back from the meeting, he put in large orders for share purchases for himself and his family. <laughs> Why should anything have changed in one week in this country? He exclaimed with proud superiority, with Swiss superiority, you know, you could say. I cabled my partners, keep clients out, out of the market, crisis just beginning. And in the middle of December 1929, you know, after it happened, I returned to Zurich. There I found an invitation from General von Sicht, the president of the Reich Supreme Court. Now, so this is really behind the screens, you know, how they are robbing the American people of everything, you know. And remember, Swiss did it again, you know, like, uh, well, they did it with the jaywalkers. And the Nazis, they did it uh, in, in the crisis of uh, 1980, I think it was. The, 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 the world financial crisis and the, um, the tax evasion stuff, you know, there was also Morgan here, the House of Morgan and, and all these same banks and the Federal Reserve. They never stop and nobody's ever stopping them. Therefore, in order to get the Wall Street crash heist into Switzerland, the Raven of Zurich had to know the actual US president of the time, which he did, as the Swiss Raven was friends with President Herbert Hoover himself, also of Swiss descent, by the name of Huber. Therefore, Herbert Hoover fed the Austrian population in 1918 after the war, that was the First World War, through US aid. Well, it always looks good to pretend to be philanthropic and hand back a tiny, teeny bit of the huge amount of stolen assets. And anyway, 
it was the US taxpayer who finally paid the bill. So, I mean, look at them. They have exactly the same nose, same squeezed lips, the same chin with this little thing in there here too. The same ears, and the ears are very important, you know, for to recognize the same ears, same head, the same broad uh, brachycephalic heads. And their real names were Huber. I looked it up and I put it in my film, The Swiss Beast, Home of the Devil, number one. And they Americanized it into Hoover. So this is Herbert Hoover. He was the, the American president at the same, at the same time in 1929 of the uh, the Wall Street crash heist and he was the director of the FBI also at the same time he was for 50 years half a century the director of the FBI and J Edgar Hoover real name Hoover and um, in 1929 he was the director of the FBI and it said in the book, The Raven of Zurich, that the Raven knew Herbert Hoover. But I wrote it down somewhere and I can't find it anymore. Um, you can buy the book yourself. And yeah, it's the same family. I mean, the enemy within of the, uh, uh, in the United States, um, they are very real. And uh, the US has been taken over since a very long time, you know. And it all comes out of the Knights Templars, who founded Switzerland in 1291. So, at page 158, the Raven even says so in his memoirs, how he went to the Federal Reserve in the US during the Wall Street crash of 1929, and discussed the matter with the Fed's officials. Now, what's the Swiss Raven doing in the US talking to the Fed during the Wall Street crash? Huh? Well, you tell me, or should I rather tell you? So here you see the Raven of Zurich, here the uh, mystical Raven or metaphysical Raven, as this one the title is, of course, a reference not to the normal bird, but to the metaphysical uh, message in, um, in the old cultures. And here's the Wall Street crash of 1929. And he was there. Funny thing is that the BIS, the Bank uh, for International Settlements, was founded on May 17th, 1930. And just before, one month before, on April the 2nd, 1930, the same year, the Raven married his countess, May Domblin de Ville. Guess things were doing all right due to the Wall Street crash heist that he needed to celebrate it with a marriage as he knew by then that he made it to the top with his future and his future family secured. I mean, marrying a countess, you have to put something on the table, right? By then, he already had been living in Switzerland for eight years, from 1922 onwards on the mountain of the sun in Zurich. So here you see the bis with the Swiss flag. I, I, I went here filming once and it is in Basel, uh, next to Germany and next to France. And it was founded on May 17th, 1930. Here's the Raven of Zurich. It says the Raven and on April the 2nd, 1930, just before the founding of the biz, where the, the Wall Street crash money went to, the whole heist, um, he married his countess because he knew he made it and he had, um, he had it on the table for his countess. You know, you need something for a countess, right? 
So on their website here, the biz.org, biz Bank for International Settlements, and here their, their square and compass logo with the Swiss colors and the Knights Templars colors. They even say it was founded on January 20th, 1930. It's very complicated, all this financial stuff. Maybe they make a difference between founding and when they really are using it, you know. So this is even better. And he, you know, he got married uh, on May 17th, no, April 2nd. So uh, the, he was absolutely sure, you know, he, he had everything on the table for his counters. So then here the bank was founded uh, before he got married and he was completely sure and everything was okay. And then he got married. And you say, okay, hi, look, darling, I made it, you know. And the founders are Yalmar Schacht and Montague Norman. And, and the raven knew them all. It's all in the book. The first baron, Norman. They're all barons and, and countesses. And, and listen, I don't see any jaywalkers, you know, in the whole equation. And, and never, ever. It's Pharaoh's nobility all over. You know, look at history. In Switzerland, the raven also knew the seven heads of the beast, like the federal councillor Obrecht, to be seen on page 185. The raven knew them all. All right. So here it says, the federal council. Here he is. He came from Grinchen. He was elected 1935, and uh, he stopped 1940. And his successor was Edmund Schultes. Funny, I know the name. Schultes, the uh, daughter or granddaughter of uh, the Count von Stauffenberg, who tried to kill Hitler on July 20th. His daughter or granddaughter, her name is now uh, Schultes, and living in Zurich. You can, you can. You can all look it up. So this here you see the Swiss flag here in a coat of arms here. And uh, this is their original, the Federal Council of the original uh, website. And you all see the, uh, the little moustache, eh? That was quite popular in Switzerland, of course, at the time. You know, at the time of the Second World War. The same moustache as, uh, as Mr. Hitler. So here, also on page 183, the chapter Ideological Preparations for the Second World War, 1936-1938. Now, why is he calling it ideological? You know, the ide ide ideological thing here is Switzerland, their base, you know. And he's actually preparing Switzerland for the war because he knows, as the raven, you know, Odin's little bird, and, um, you know, uh, giving the uh, ill omen and the bringer of death in many cultures. Well, it's not the fault of the poor, the poor bird, of course. And, um, you know, he's, um, he, he knows, the raven knows what's coming. You know? So here it says, yeah. Uh, However, the older members of the audience seem to be taken aback by the definite forecast of war that I expressed throughout my speech. You know, was probably in the um, in the Villa Schoenberg, yeah, where Hitler was. Such frank talk about international affairs was a rare exception in cautious Switzerland. A few days after, afterward, Federal Councillor Obrecht, Hermann Obrecht, whom I had not previously previously known, the chief of the economic department in Bern, called on me to discuss measures for economic war preparedness. So the Raven is preparing Switzerland for the war. Yeah. So uh, we stayed here and it goes on. Obrecht began with an unusual question. The leaders of the agricultural interests as well as the social democrats have spoken of me with great respect. Now, he's the man behind it all. So they talked about him with great respect and advised him to contact me. My own banking, confrère, that means uh, brothers, like in a brotherhood, confrère. That's why I'm using the, like the French name, because all the initiated know, know now it's, 
you know, he's talking about a brother, the brotherhood, you know, Freemasons, nobility and all that. Otherwise, he would, use, he would use another word, yeah? On the other hand, so my own banking Freemason uh, and nobility brothers, that's what it means, on the other hand, and the association of bankers had complained of deliberate, well, it's on the next page, and here, uh, on page 185, it says, I added, the Raven added, that Switzerland should no longer hesitate to take war preparedness measures. I quickly summarized the basic raw materials needed for war. Well, he knows everything, because four years during the entire World War I, he was the head of the Belgian mission, the, the German mission in uh, Belgium. He was ruling the whole country in Belgium, you know. And so he knows it all, and thereby laid down certain principles which were adopted by Obrecht, Hermann Obrecht, one of the seven heads of the beast, yeah, and which gave the Swissies war econ economy from that point on its special character, you know, well, and so forth, and so forth. So this guy, not even the... Um, the uh, federal councillor Obrecht, he took all the measures. No, the Raven of Zurich. And we never heard of this guy, you know? We all talk about Roch Rothschild and, and all the other ones. We never, you know, because they stay behind the screens, you know? And it's all Pharaoh's nobility, you know? So we have to think differently. Or, or I do, but I mean, you, you know? It's all here, and unfortunately, I can't show you the whole book, but I just give you a, an idea, you know, who this guy was. And there's no, there's no coincidence. He, you know, he was nicknamed the Raven, yeah, the Raven of Zurich. Also knew the Austrian Emperor Franz Josef, who had his wife murdered, in guess where. Yes, Switzerland. And I made this video about it. So this is the Empress Sissy. You know, if you turn around, you get Isis. Elizabeth of Austria slain by an anarchist. The Empress stabbed to the heart. And where did it happen? Yeah, Geneva, Switzerland. Because this woman was very, very much against wars. She was in a anti-militarist, a pacifist, and I guess there wouldn't be a First World War because Austria was really a mighty, huge empire, uh, which lasted until um, uh, 1918, after the um, uh, First World War. That was the end of many, many empires, the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, so it's on my channel, Gatsefrats here, nine years ago. And here is the uh, Swissy Killed Sissy. And here's the title. So you just, um, if you punch it in, you probably won't pop out. So you probably have to scroll down in the, uh, in the video section. And uh, she was married with the, the last emperor of, um, of Austria, uh, Franz Josef, who also wanted, of course, to go to come back and uh, get back on the throne, you know, just as Emperor Wilhelm II. It's, it's again the internal war within the aristocracy between the, uh, the vertical and the horizontal rule. And, of course, then the, uh, uh, the Order of the Garter. Who, and as the raven, new German emperor Wilhelm II, and some World War I German aristocratic generals, he became the head of the German mission to Belgium throughout the whole First World War, from 1914 to 1918, in order to pillage Belgium for raw materials for the German war industry. So in 1914, the Raven was only 33 years old 
as he was born in 1881 in Vienna. And one must really be born in some powerful dynasty when practically ruling over Belgium during World War I at the age of 33 only. So here on page 80, um, chapter 17, called The First World War, My German Mission to Belgium. So this guy is not even German. He's Austrian and Swiss. And um, he's only 33 and practically ruling the whole of Belgium. Uh, how is this possible, you know? On August the 1st, 1914, well, August the 1st is the national holiday of Switzerland, and um, when they were founded in 1291. So, well, I'm not going to show everything here. It's um, best thing is to uh, to read the whole book for yourself, and I'm just giving you an idea. Here on page 91, chapter 18, the meeting of the war economy in the Ministry of the Interior on November 15, 1914. So the Ministry of the Interior of Germany, for an Austrian 33-year-old guy. So I'll read for you. The Ministry of the Interior in Berlin arranged a meeting for November 15, 1914 in which senior civil servants were to establish a program for the direction of the war economy. You know, they're going to pillage Belgium for raw materials. The governor of the military government in Belgium ordered Lum, I think it was a general, and myself to travel to Berlin and attend the meeting to which the heads uh, of the most important military, economic and treasury departments were summoned by State Secretary Richter. Not much more than three months had gone by since the war began, and the severe shortcomings in German war preparations were already apparent. So they know they, they don't have enough war materials, and that's why he's sent to Belgium to arrange all that, you know. The military had grossly underestimated the need for material, as had been demonstrated even in the earliest battles. So here at the end, end of page 91, the same page as before, the rest is also important, but uh, I just take the most important stuff here out of here. No European great power had stockpiled sufficient raw materials or even marshaled its foreign assets in the last year of peace. Thus the war economy was not in any sense equal to the new situation. You know, Germany having is having problems. They don't have all the colonies and and like England, you know, being an island, uh, having shipments, so they have to steal it somewhere else. And like in this case, in Belgium, and the Raven of Zurich went there, you know, to see to that. The invitation to the meeting at the Ministry of the Interior was itself evidence of the serious position. When the military caste, especially in wartime, calls for help from civilians and even agrees to submit in their authority, the need is most acute. The question for discussion was that of covering our needs for raw materials. Now, going to Belgium, here, yeah, the question for discussion was that of covering our needs for raw materials, like pillage Belgium and how purchases were to be financed in gold, assuming the war should continue until the spring of 1915. The estimates presented to the meeting were frightening, and the proposals based on them both tentative and ill-conceived. After some two hours of discussion, I asked for the floor. I said we had been discussing how we could manage with our well, etc., etc., so he's at the head of the German mission of Belgium, you know, to pillage Belgium at 33 years old. So this is an extremely, extra, extraordinary, powerful person, the Raven of Zurich in the base of Pharaoh in the Alps. So it was somewhere in the book that the Raven knew the, uh, the Emperor of Germany, um, Wilhelm II, and the Emperor of Austria, Franz Josef. But um, I don't know where I wrote it down on what page, you know, my notes as I'm traveling with two backpacks and being a homeless. So I'm sorry for that. So the Raven 
was also a friend of Count Schwerin von Krosik. I don't know how to pronounce it. He should be supposed to be German, but a real funny name. It sounds like Egyptian. Who later became a German finance minister in 1932. So the Count became a finance minister. So here you can, on page 162, uh, chapter 37, the acute phase of the crisis and prediction of a turning point in mid-1932. So I skipped the rest here. And um, yeah, I went in March 1931 to Berlin, where I met the finance ministry state secretary, Schaeffer, and under state sec State Secretary, later Finance Minister, Count Schwerin von Krosik. <laughs> How can you pronounce this? This is not German. It's, it's Egyptian, pharaonic. You know? Who describes in his book, it happened in Germany, my, my visit, so the visits of the Raven, in 1931 and the spring of 1932. And the Count wrote about the Raven in the spring of 1931, the Swiss banker, a summary, uh, like Sumeria, who also had a reputation of an economist, called on me at the fin finance ministry. Well, and it goes on. So, again, I don't see any jaywalkers. It's all counts and barons and kings and emperors, uh, pharaohs, nobility. So, there he is. The, um, and here's his name. Lutz Graf Schwerin von Krosik. So is that, if anybody knows how to pronounce the dude's name, well, tell me, because I don't know. I have no idea. I speak perfect German. I read it. I write it. This is not German. You know, the, 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 the Graf here was a count. And it's, he was a real heavyweight eh, in politics, real heavyweight. Uh, he was a Nazi. and. Uh, the Count, Graf von Schwerin. Schwer, it means a heavy weight. Schwer, it means heavy. So he studied in Lausanne, Switzerland. Yeah. And who studied there as well? Ian Fleming did. And um, the Prince Bernhard of Darkness. You know? They all know each other. Of course they do. They're all counts and kings and, and aristocrats. Yeah. So he was uh, he, he was in the Nazi party. Uh, the president Paul von Hindenburg, you remember the picture of him uh, together with Hitler. He actually made Hitler the chancellor. Asked him to stay in office under Kurt von Schleicher. Well, another nobility, von Schleicher, Franz von Papen. I don't see any jaywalkers, people. It's all nobility. Right? And, um, um, yeah, he was appointed here the Minister of Finance by Franz von Papen in 1932. Um, and, uh, well, even after the, after the war, he continued in politics. And uh, as it says, he was in the Nazi party since 1937, so not from the beginning. He was even uh, under Konrad Adenauer after the war, a real heavyweight in politics, eh? Um, and they, um, the um, uh, the Raven, he knew them all. It's in the book. The Raven of Zurich also was a friend of Baron. Louis de Rothschild, Rothschild, the baron, yeah? Because he knows that he was a baron and that it's important, that that makes the difference between a, a jaywalker and a pharaoh. So the raven also was a friend of baron Louis de Rothschild of the jaywalker nobility. And he was friends with Montague Norman, the director of the Bank of England. So it says on page 163, in June 1931, I was with my wife, the Countess uh, uh, d'Amblin de, de Ville, in Marienbad, 
and there I received a telephone call from Baron Louis Rothschild, de Rothschild. So I just got a telephone call from the Baron of Rothschild, yeah, saying that the Austrian government was going to ask me to take over the administration of the reorganized Kreditanstalt. That's a bank. Baron de Rothschild begged me to give this proposal serious consideration. So, to take over the administration of a bank. I don't know where the bank is. Uh, I refused absolutely because he had bigger plans, you know, bigger plans, the, uh, the Raven. But he asked me at least to hear what the government people had to say. Shortly afterwards, the Austrian Minister of Finance rang to say that I had only to name my terms, oh yes, an Austrian bank, and they would be accepted regardless. And he asked me, so he just got the Minister of Finance calling him up as well, probably also an aristocrat, an aristocrat. I could look it up for you, but you look it up for yourself. Of course, they're all nobility. And he asked me not to answer immediately. So that was the Minister of Finance since I would also receive a telephone call from England. That evening, I was asked by an official calling on behalf of Montague Norman, the governor of the Bank of England. So here are supposedly, you know, like enemies from world wars and, you know, the, the, the big shots, the hot shots, you know, they're just making telephone calls with each other and... Uh, you know, it's only the people, the slaves are fighting, not these ones. Yeah, they're all friends. They're all nobility. You get it. So the governor of the Bank of England to accept the offer made by Vienna with the assurance that I would receive full support from London. Then I gave my answer with absolute clarity. I predicted the economic. Well, that's important. I show that to you. So here it goes on. I predicted, so the Raven is predicting to uh, Montague Norman and also to uh, the Roth Baron de Rothschild, I predicted the economic depressions in Germany, England and America. Yeah, of course, you know, he, he, you know, he was in it, you know. It's, it's not so much predicting, eh? he just, you know. And he predicted the coming of Hitler. Yeah, well, of course, you know, he was there at the Villa Schoenberg, you know, in 1923, of course. He was living around the corner and he knew, he knew them all. And then later the Second World War. He's predicting the Second World War. No, he knew the Second World War. You know, that's why this man is so important. So, and that's why he was called the Raven of Zurich as a raven, you like Odin's raven, is a raven is predicting uh, the ill omen in many like uh, superstitions in many cultures. Of course, it's not true. It's I mean, it's all it's it's their pharaonic you know superstition superstition anyway. I think a raven is a beautiful bird, and you know, for us Europeans, you know, normal white people, you know. It's just a normal, it's a beautiful bird, and, and that's it, you know. All this religious hocus-pocus is all coming from the Middle East and these pharaohs, you know, and all the superstition and all that, and the black magic. Even if I were prepared to make the great personal sacrifice, uh, it's a personal sacrifice because he had higher plans. I, he didn't want to be the director of just some bank in, in Austria. That would be entailed in taking on the Kreditanstalt in Austria. A man with my views, whoa, he's getting arrogant here, was not appropriate for the, a position at Europe's weakest point. You know, the weakest point is the uh, the empire, the Austro-Hungarian empire that uh, just collapsed and became very tiny. I advised my caller, so that was uh, Montague Norman, to appoint some hack who saw the future in less pessimistic terms than a raven, you know, and then asked him to be kind enough to let me go on with my Marienbad holiday. I was thereupon asked, well, etc., etc. So it's not so much about predicting. This guy knew Hitler was coming, the Second World War was coming, because he was there in Switzerland. He was always there everywhere. He knew all the counts and all the 
countesses, married with a countess, all the, the, the emperors, uh, he knew them all, you know, the raven. He's proud of his nickname, the raven. You know, he's, and, and then he's laughing, you know, he's like in himself, like, you know, he knows it all and the other people are saying, oh, how can he predict it? You know, the raven. How can the raven predict it all with his ill omen? Because he knew. He knew. Mr. Sumeria, he knew. So here is Montague Norman, a baron, the first baron Norman, you know, from the Normans, yeah? They were once ruling uh, over England, you know, the Norman conquest. It's the baron Norman, probably also speaking French, you know. It's, it's all nobility. And remember the video I made uh, on the um, Elon Musk uh, Holderman dynasty, uh, one of his ancestors of the Holderman dynasty was also the uh, director of the, uh, the Bank of England, also a Holderman. Uh, and here it says, he also joined the uh, fourth Bet Bedfordshire and he uh, Herefordshire militia in 1894 and served in the Second Boer War. Uh, uh, he was awarded the Distinguished uh, Service Order, the DSO, in 1901. Well, what did they do there? They murdered 25,000 uh, Boer children, you know, in my country. That's what they did, and he gets a medal for it, you know. And it was the um, it was the nobility anyway. You know, Churchill was there, Lord Churchill, uh, one of the guys of the Balfour Declaration. He was the uh, the governor of South Africa. Even I don't recall his name. There was Lord Kitchener, the butcher, and he was there as well. He was just calling with the raven and yeah, let's do this and let's do that. You know, the stupid slaves. You know they. And here he became a partner in Brown Shepley in 1900 before leaving for South Africa and retired. So they're all in business, politics, nobility, everything at the same time. Just as today, all these politicians, they're all like Donald Trump. They're all billionaires. And Trump is also of a of the um, um, of the nobility, Swiss from his father's side of the Palatines in Germany connecting the Rhine, connecting the Palatines with Switzerland, and from his mother's side, the Scottish side, uh, from a line of um, Scandinavian, uh, Norwegian, Danish uh, nobility. You know, he's, uh, he's somewhere a cousin with the, with the queen of, you know, these Scandinavian countries, you know. So no Norman was a close friend of the German Central Bank President, Jalmar Schacht. Well, together with the Raven, well, etc. You know, both were members of the Anglo-German Fellowship and the Bank of International Settlements in Basel. Well, there he is again. You know, the beast. Yeah. Uh, well, etc. etc. Uh, who did he marry? Uh, Married this one probably also uh, yeah here Priscilla Cecilia Maria Rhinteens Rhinteens a granddaughter of Montague Bertie the seventh Earth Earl of uh, Abingdon <laughs> well okay well you know there's a sort of their castle here you know this is where he was living probably it's uh, nobility all over. Pharaoh's nobility leading us into world wars and the third one coming up. The Raven of Zurich was also friends with the Countess, Countess Lanskoronska, whom you can see here in some sort of a uniform. Uh, Polish, it says here Polish with a sort of a dragon on her shoulder on the patch. So... He's, she's got, I'm not going to pronounce this. It's a very long Polish aristocratic uh, name. So it says here, the Countess, that's what a Count looks like, with an octagon, a sash, a pharaonic sash, and the rest, okay. Uh, so she was a Polish noble, yeah. Uh, a resistance fighter, well, forget it. 
Yeah, she probably sort of was mixed into it, but that's the internal war within the nobility. So the uh, the old world order, the vertical rule, the royalists, they were shoved aside by the new rule, the horizontal rule of the republicans. Uh, they were just fighting to get their castles back, you know, um, and, you know, all these big properties are not really allowed in the horizontal rule. But as we're going back more and more to a feudal system, it's more and more allowed. So the the horizontal rule actually now, it's the last for the last 10 or 20 years, it's becoming more and more a vertical rule again. You know, if you've got like leaders like Donald Trump, who is multi-billionaire, you know, having castles himself and coming out of a castle, you know, it's all coming back under the uh, under the veil of the uh, New World Order uh, horizontal rule. Okay, and um, you know, she lived at her family's palace, the the Palace Lankoronsky. Oh, look at that! It's huge, huge. You know, so don't believe she was like a. Um, a resistance fighter for the Polish people against the horrible Nazis and all that. No, the Nazis, you know, it's well, I showed that in my, in my, especially in my last video about the um, uh, the agent of the um, of the Order of the Guard, oh, the agent of the Carter, uh, Adolf Hitler. You know, it is complicated, you know. So there's a lot more to see here. And yes, yeah, she went to a concentration camp, but you know, why? Because of this internal war in the nobility. So that doesn't mean she was at our side. No, not at all. Oh, look, after the war, she left Poland and lived in Fribourg in Switzerland. Well, okay, got it. Yeah, well, she knew, yeah, because she knew the raven, the raven of Zurich. It's in the book, I'll show it to you. Yeah, that's why she went there to Switzerland. Why, why, why would she leave Poland? You know, she was a resistance fighter, so she should have been like honored. Well, she couldn't get because the communists were there, so she couldn't get her castle back, right? Because the communists—that's the, uh, the the new horizontal rule in those parts in those parts of the world yeah in our in the uh, in the western parts of the world it's also the horizontal rule but it's more like the capitalist horizontal rule so even within the horizontal rule the new world's order even there there's an internal war you see uh it's it's, it's incredibly complicated so so you know they also had the royal castle that was theirs the, it's the Lankoronsky collection and the Wawel Castle. Very powerful family, very powerful dynasty. So no wonder the Raven of Zurich, you know, she he very fond to keep her in his collection of friends and other counters, just like his wife. So here, the Raven of Zurich, on page 242, the other lunch guest was Countin, Countess Lanskoronska, the daughter of Count Lanskoronski, the Polish connoisseur, connoisseur uh, from the French word connaître, meaning someone who knows himself, you know, you know, about things, whose house near the Belvedere, that means uh, a good sight, good seeing, Belvedere, Vedere, it means to see, Bel, it means good, in Vienna, whose collections and whose personality were all e equally unforgettable to those who knew him. Terrible things had happened to the daughter during the German occupation of Poland. She told us about it calmly and with a resigned air, as if her personal fate was a matter of indifference to her. Well, if you have a noble upbringing, you know, um this is the way you are taught to to behave you know it's called the uh, etiquette you know it's, uh, keep a distance from everything and everyone uh if one has the misfortune to live in a time of leaders who exp 
who pander to the worst instincts in the masses. What else can one expect? Any hint of attempting to arouse sympathy or pity was quite alien to the Countess. Proud spirit. As a Pole, she belonged to a people who had been used to oppression for 150 years. Well, <laughs> you know, it was the nobility oppressing the people. So, you know, this is... This is a weird sentence, you know, of course, written by a nobleman. And as an aristocrat, she was accustomed to standing alone. In spite of everything, she preferred to stay where she belonged in Poland, in a world ruled by the worst elements of the people. You know, so the, an aristocrat, the Raven of Zurich, together with his countess uh, friend Lanskoronska, you know, they're talking about the people and, and calling them the worst elements. You know, it's like, you know, being at, the, at, at some royal court, you know, hearing them talk about the slaves of Pharaoh and made no concession to the times, not in the hope for a, a better future, for after all, what difference was there between a proletarian from Upper Austria and one from the Cauc Caucasus? Yeah, the proletarian. Yeah. Well. So the um, the counter counters Lanskoronska, very extremely powerful family. The Raven of Zurich. He knew them all. He knew all the players of Pharaoh's elite during the two world wars and beyond doing all the wheeling and dealing for them out of Pharaoh's bays in the Alps, where all their money is and where they're hiding all their valuables. So here, uh, chapter 39 at page uh, 167, it's about here in 1932, the Swiss citizenship, which he gets just, you know, just like that, you know. And here, the page after, 168, uh, on July 30th, 1932, my wife gave birth to a son whom we named Wolfgang in honor of Goethe, another Freemason, and it is Wolfgang von Goethe, nobility, whose anniversary year was being celebrated. He was the second of our children to be born in Zurich. They all became Swissies, and of course, they got all the descendants got all very powerful. Uh, jobs everywhere, and my wife and I decided in their interest to take up Swiss citizenship. Um, I had not given up my Austrian citizenship throughout the nine years I was in Germany or the 14 years I worked in Switzerland, but now it was, after all, some 23 years since I left uh, Vienna. Actually, afterwards, they after the war, they uh, they even went to America and probably also got um, American citizenship. So, and he says here, you know, he I decided to take up Swiss citizenship. Now, I know after twenty six years of terror in Switzerland, a an immigrant can't decide to take up Swiss citizenship. You know. It's the Swissies who decide if whether or not you're going to get their great Swiss citizenship. Well, I mean, the Swiss slaves, they think they decide, but they don't decide. Because here you can see this is the Pharaoh's nobility who can say, I decide, not the Swiss decide nothing. And in fact, both for the Pharaoh's nobility, like the raven here, and for immigrants from other countries, the slif, the uh, the Swissies, uh, the slaves of Switzerland themselves are are just are just a plain nuisance, more and more to Pharaoh's nobility as well. And in the end, they don't decide anything; just they're just thinking that they're deciding themselves and being the masters of Switzerland, which they are far, far from being that. You know, they are, um, they are the slaves of, uh, of Pharaoh's base, you know. 
and who went through a lot of poverty as well. So here it's funny to see this. I decided to take up Swiss citizenship. Me, homie Ross, I was an immigrant like in Switzerland. They never gave me, a, uh, they gave me so much of a hassle and terror, put me in prison uh, because they didn't want to give me a, a Swiss um, a permit to be there. I said, no, you're illegal here and all that, you know. And this guy just said, oh, oh, I decided to take up Swiss citizenship for me and my counter's wife and my children. You know, I decided, yes. So, you know, and me, homie Ross, I can't even see my children grow up. My, and my children don't even have their dad, you know. So you see, you know, it's, it's, it's a two-way laws, you know, especially in Switzerland, you know. It's really the base of the elite who can do whatever they want. They're above all the laws and there's no Swiss slave who can tell them what to do and what not to do. But the Swiss slaves, they can say it of a, to a normal and about a normal immigrant like Homie Ross, what he should do and what he can't do. You know, it's mostly about what he can't do. Yeah. So this is how it works here. And I, I just read it here, you know. It's, um, Absurdistan in the Alps, yeah? as the raven was both a banker and pulling strings in politics and most of all behind the politics. He could say things like the state alone is responsible for inflation. Inflation without government or indeed against government is impossible. Well, he could say this because he knew exactly of what people all the governments in the world consisted of. His own clan of Pharaoh's nobility deciding whether yes or no in inflation would take place to skim the milk and rob the people. Apparently, his memoirs, The Raven of Zurich, were published just after World War II and giving a lot of valuable information about the powers behind the screens and their base, Switzerland in the Alps. Not knowing that many years later there would be a certain Homie Ross and a thing called the Internet analyzing this very dangerous information about the ones in power and their main base in the Alps. The Raven of Zurich. <laughs>